Namaskar, hello everyone, sorry for the delay, um, had a little bit of technical issues with Facebook, so yeah, we're up and running and I hope this, um, you, this you find everything healthy and well. And yeah, today we're going to go through a topic known as science and application of managing high performance athletes. Um, and I hope to share some of the experiences I've had over the last 10 years or so where we look at um, different ways of managing high performance athletes that I've learned working with different athletes all over the world. So I hope that some of the information you are able to use and you find it at least a little bit interesting. I'd like to ask everyone that's on Instagram if you'll turn your phone to landscape because I'm going to switch the camera around and uh, so you can actually see the presentation. Unfortunately we couldn't share the screen on Facebook. So if you are following on Facebook, if you want to log on to some media site on Instagram then you'll be able to see the presentation. Bear with me for one minute while I turn the camera around and I hope you find some of the information um, useful. Okay, so we're all set. So hopefully you've turned your cameras around if you're following on Instagram and you're able to see the presentation. Um, so the whole crux of the presentation today is to give you an oversight on how I go about managing high performance athletes. And my whole role is to ensure that the athletes that I work with, we can keep on, um, on the park and as fit as possible for as long as possible. And there's various ways and methods that we look at trying to do this in high performance sport. So the first thing that I would, would want to look at is to ensure that the athletes that I work with are robust athletes. And what do we mean by robust athletes? And one of the most important things is to understand a robust athlete would be someone that's healthy, powerful, vigorous, and resilient to the demands that are placed on them. And I think that last part is one of the most important parts to understand because what we need to do is build up an athlete's load over a period of time to ensure that whatever the coaches throw at them, whatever demands that they are faced with, within a competition environment that they are resilient enough to withstand that load or intensity that they are placed at with minimum risk of injury. And that's the most important thing. We want to reduce their risk of injury through various implementation of um, sports science, strength and conditioning, monitoring strategies. And we're going to go through all these. So some of the strategies that we look at to build robust athletes would be athlete profiling. So what testing do we do to create a profile so I know as a performance specialist what do we need to work on for these athletes. We look at athlete risk screening, look at strength and conditioning strategies to improve performance, but at the same time while we're improving performance, we are also looking at um, reducing their injury risk. And then also different athlete monitoring strategies that we can use to identify either neuromuscular fatigue, and other fatigue markers to ensure that we can um, perform at our highest level. So one of the most important things to remember is that we want to start with the end in mind. And what I mean by that is that I kind of equate it to going on a holiday. So if you don't know where your destination is, you just get in your car and you drive, you might end up at that destination. However, the process and the journey towards that destination is uncertain. So the same with athletic performance is that we want to know what type of athlete we want to produce at what time in our cycle or performance program. So if we take, for example, a four-year Olympic cycle um, and we look at, okay, we want to be able to qualify for Olympics in what would have been now in Tokyo 2020, and then we work backwards from there. When is our qualification period? And then we, everything we do needs to align with those goals that we have, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. And that is the, one of the most important parts is that all the small things we do will affect the things that we want to achieve as different peaking strategies in our program. So there needs to be some sort of paradigm shift um, in our mindsets because at the moment, a lot of people design their training programs for short term competitive performance. What do I mean by that is that we're only looking from day to day, from one competition to another competition. We need to understand that everything we do today will affect tomorrow. Everything we do tomorrow affects a week from now, or a month from now, and so on and so forth. So it's really important that we understand the effects of everything we're doing on not only the short-term benefits for the athletes, the acute changes that we have, but also 
the long-term benefits that they'll have or the, the, the process that we'll have to ensure that they perform and peak at the right times. So again, it's really important to make sure that we know what our mission is. So one of the things that we know is that one of the most inefficient approaches is, um, is that focusing on the now, although it can facilitate um, the performance in the early years of our athletes, but can generally be detrimental to optimal development of that athlete and, comprise, and probably compromise their future performances. So if we're only focusing on the now and not focusing on how to put everything together over a long period of time, we're probably not doing our athletes justice to perform at the right times and peak at the right time. So it's really important that we put that together. So probably a more efficient approach would be aim for athletic trainings that should enable an athlete to tolerate various training loads and intensities to maximize their technical and tactical um, coaching. So what do we mean by that is that Everything we do as a multidiscipline performance team needs to be geared towards making sure the athletes are um, better at their sport. So yes, they can become fitter, they can become stronger, but is that transferring into the sport or on, into the competition that we are playing? And that's something that we've been looking at and we need to under identify how we get to that point, um, which we'll speak about a little bit later. Most important thing to understand that it is a process. It does not happen overnight, and we need to make sure that there is a plan and a long-term plan in place with um, short-term goals. And those short-term goals need to um, help with the long-term um, planning and peaking strategies that you have. So there's a very good statement, and I've seen this not only in junior athletes, but also in elite level athletes, is that it's evident that most youth, and like I said, I would argue in some elite level athletes, lack the basic fitness and athleticism, therefore starting at a very low base of physical fitness and possibly technical skill. Although most of the time what you find is that their technical skills are really good, however, they their, their general um, physical capabilities and their general funda move, fundamental movement patterns are not as well-defined or well-established as what they should be. Therefore, we need to, effect, through effective programming, ensure that we teach our athletes to move better, teach our athletes to be stronger, fitter, and, strong, and um, more efficient in their movement patterns. And this will help with the long-term um, athletic de development model and instead of a short-term fix. So it's really important putting that in place, not only at the elite level, but probably more importantly at a young athlete's level to ensure by the time they get to the elite level, they are able to um, perform the fundamental movement patterns without being retaught them. So we spoke about um, a little bit about the introduction and how we go about certain things. So there's a very good statement that was coined by a team called Exos known as every, game's ga every day is game day. And what they mean by that is that every single day that you're training, you're competing, you need to put in place a performance plan. And how that performance plan helps you perform day in and day out is really important. So like I said, this coin, um, term was coined by Exos or Mark Verstappen, and he's the owner of Exos. And they look at understanding what is your athlete's why, what makes them tick. And as a performance team, you need to have a really good understanding of what is it that's going to make the difference for your athlete, what is it that they personally feel is their um, strengths and weaknesses, and design everything not only around what's good for their sport, which we'll speak on shortly, but also what makes them tick. If you can get the athletes buy-in, generally their adaptations and everything that they do according to um, your program will work better if they trust you not only as a professional but as a person who is looking after their best interest. So what we, what we want to know is what is your athlete's why? The athlete's it or why is their purpose and their purpose is defined by the it and why. So for example defining the it and why is their, perfect, is their purpose and defining that it will dictate their performance plan. So what is their performance plan? How do they see they're going to make it from point X to point Y and so on and so forth? How do we make sure that we help them in the way that they actually want to um, improve their performance? So once you know your athletes it or their why and what makes them tick, you can help them prepare for it, you can help them feel for it, you can help them train for it, and also you can rest for it. 
So all this needs to become part of your performance plan and your strategies to help their performance. So their it's and their why should be a statement that summarizes who they are and where they want to be. So it's again understanding where the end is, what point they want to peak, and then how they're going to go there and what process you're going to put in place to ensure and help them peak. So we spoke about the performance day and there's various aspects that are important to performance day and things such as nutrition, the mindset, the recovery, movement, all help you map that performance day. So how what you do every single day affects what you're going to be doing the next day. So if you know what training you're going to be doing today, how does that affect the training session you're going to do tomorrow? The recovery you're doing now, how does that affect the training session you're going to do tomorrow? And everything plays a role in that whole um, ecosystem of performance. So one of the important thing is fueling for it. So we've already had a nutrition talk by a dietitian, so I'm not going to go into depth, but we know we need to fuel for it. So what sort of um, unprocessed carbohydrates can we have that will help us um, perform better and get the fuels we need? Well, how much protein do we need to repair and rebuild the muscles that are broken down um, during our training session? Um, what sort of um, amino acids do we need to help the brain function and anti-inflammatory processes and so on and so forth from hydration and also vitamins and minerals to help our immune systems. So one thing we have to remember, and I know Shrikant did a really good presentation yesterday on um, training load for adolescent athletes, but this is also extremely important in your elite level athletes as what training is all about is that continuous balance between fitness and fatigue and how we actually get that balance right will determine whether our athletes peak or not. And this becomes extremely important because if our fatigue is too high at a certain period of time when we want our athletes to peak, we're probably not going to get the best performance that we could get out of them. So we need to ensure that fitness and fatigue, that continuous battle between, between the two is well planned throughout your training um, cycle and that at important times when we want those adaptations, we want those physiological overloads so they can become better athletes, that their, fit, their fatigue may be a little bit high. However, when we want them to peak for, competitive, for competition, we need to ensure that their fatigue is low and their fitness is high, so that interplay between the relationship. So again, if you can see in that paper where it says training injury para and prevention paradox, should athletes train smarter and harder? Athletes 100% have to train really hard to get better. However, we've got to be smart about it and we need to paradise our recovery into these um, plans to ensure that we can actually get these things, um, get the athletes peak at the right time. Like I said, we need to train hard, we need to train um, often to be elite athletes. However, if we're not um, paradising that recovery into our program, we are doing our athletes a disservice because we want them to perform day in and day out, and sometimes some athletes are training two or three times a day. Um, what recovery strategies are going to be placed? When are they important? Because certain recovery strategies are important at certain times, um, and we need to prioritize that. And then I showed that in a paper I published a while back where we looked at how to build robust athletes within a South African um, school environment where we understand that the earlier we start the development with young athletes, the better they become as they get older and older and older because to get them out of bad habits when they're at elite level is really difficult. However, if we can introduce things at an early age, it's a lot easier to identify these things um, over time. So we spoke a little bit about profiling earlier and the profiling is so important for us because what we need to realize is we need to create an athlete profile for each individual within our team. So if you're working in a team sport, like currently I'm working with the women's hockey team, I need to know that within that team we have 20, 30, sometimes 33, 40 different individuals that all have different physiology, all starting from a different level. And when we first joined the team in 2017, everyone had um, a certain level of fitness that we needed to address. But how uh, did I go about it trying to figure out where we start and where we need to go from there. And that's where athlete profiling comes in. But to understand athlete profiling, what we need to realize is that sport has basically become Darwinian in nature, in that generally the bigger, faster, fitter, and stronger athletes make it to elite level. So we know that athletes have to be fitter, they have to be stronger, and they have to be faster. That is not the only determinant, it's just one determinant of elite level um, performance. 
but physicality in most sports nowadays has become extremely important. And this has been shown in the literature pretty well. So he has a really good study by Norton where he looked over a long period of time and showed that athletes are getting not only bigger but getting stronger in, the, in over a 20-year period. Then I showed the same thing in a master study that I published in Rugby Union where we looked at um, changes within the body size, strength characteristics of under 20 rugby players. And we saw that over that 13-year period, players got significantly bigger, stronger and faster in that period of time. And it's really important for us to understand that because if we want our athletes to be competing at elite level now and to build that resilience, all these things play a very important role. And then in another good paper um, that was published by Tucker and Collins, they looked at what makes a champion. And basically the summary of the paper is looked at everyone has a predefined genetic um, threshold. And there's not, not much we can do about that genetic threshold. However, my role as a performance specialist or as a multidisciplinary performance team in a high performance environment, we need to look at what can we do to try and ensure that we get the most out of our athletes. So they got a threshold of X. Can we get them to X squared? Can we get them to more than that over a period of time through the implementation of the bed of good program programming and peaking strategies? So the first thing we need to look at is the sport we're involved with. Every sport has different um, energy systems, every sport has different force velocity pro um, profiles, and we need to understand the sport that we're involved with where before we actually look at the programming side of things. So to get the desired training effect of a particular sport, you need to ensure you replicate the demands of that sport in several ways. And that will help with the training transfer. And the training transfer, all that that means is that everything we do in a high performance program needs to help the athletes actual sport they're involved with. If we are not doing that, we are probably not doing the athlete any justice and we're not actually helping them anything. We need to ensure everything we apply from a performance side of things, from the strength conditioning to the condition um, to monitoring strategies, everything helps their on-field performance. So some of the things we need to look at is the kinetic similarities. What are the um, horizontal forces? What are the vertical forces that are involved in um, the different um, sports that you're involved with? So if we, for example, we take high jump as an example, there's a lot that goes on in high jumps. So we need the correct velocity on our approach. We need a good force and the ground contact time needs to be as short as possible with a maximum amount of force that they're producing. And then they get a rotational um, force with grab a rotational force and um, carrying them over the bar. So a lot goes on in a short period of time to ensure that they are actually able to produce their performance. And how do we help that athlete produce better performance? And the same with hockey. The hockey is a very chaotic environment when they're playing the match. We need to produce maximum speeds, fast changes of direction, accelerations, decelerations, all while using stick and ball, producing skills, and using peripheral vision. Um, and making the right decisions at the right time. So it's really, really important that we understand that what the different kind of kinematic and kinetic um, similarities are. So movement similarities we've spoken about, what are the different forces that are placed on the body at different sports, and then the neurophysiological similarities. So what are the energy systems that are used? What are the different force profiles that are used in the sport? And by understanding these things, we can actually design a program that is a lot more conducive to training transfer for your sport that you're involved with. So that's just an example of a picture explaining that there are always different forces that are um, acting on the body at the same time. And if you can teach your athletes to be comfortable in uncomfortable positions, their chance of injury is a lot less and then they'll also perform a lot better. So if you are interested in reading a paper, there's a really good paper called um, Concurrent Strength and, Strength and Endurance Training um, from Molecules to Man. But the crux of that paper, what I would like to show you is that you need to understand where your sport fits on the speed, strength and endurance continuum. So if your sport, for example, we go weightlifting, which is on the high end of the speed and the lowest end of the endurance continuum, and then you look at hockey, for example, which is in the middle of that continuum with a high, high amount of endurance required, a lot of speed and a lot of strength that's required. So understanding where your sport lies in that allows you to go about planning your training program a lot better. 
So importantly, we also need to remember if we're not collecting any data, we're not creating any profiles, we can't manage our athletes really well. So that statement there, you can't manage what you don't measure, is extremely important. Because if we're not measuring things, how do we actually go about creating a, a performance program that is conducive to increasing performance at the right times? So there's certain things such as conditioning profile, strength and power profile, and injury risk profile that we can cover and have a look at. So again, I said earlier, if the training that we are doing is not conducive to increasing performance, like um, on the, on, in the actual sport, it becomes really difficult for us to actually do a good job. We need to ensure everything we're doing improves the on-field performance, regardless of the sport we are working with. So I've got a little video of just different types of profiling. And the most important take-home message with this video is to show that there are different tests that are utilized for different sports. And you want to understand what sports you're involved with, you need to identify which test you're going to do. And I'll show you how we go through that process from a, a team sport perspective or hockey perspective um, in the slides to come. So as you can see, there are various tests that you can do. But you should not be testing for the sake of testing. You should be testing to get information that is going to help you um, program for your um, to help your athletes get better. And depending on the test that you actually choose, you can create a really good athlete profile um, that you can monitor over a period of time. Okay, so if we have a look at testing in team sports, and we're just looking at conditioning testing, for example, we got a couple of energy systems. I know David John went through um, different. Um, testing battery or physiology with you. And just as an example, we want to, I want to know for hockey, what is my athlete's aerobic capacity? What is their anaerobic capacity? And what is their max velocity? If I get those three measures, I'm able to program their conditioning really specifically, not only to hockey, but to the, the individual as well. And there are different tests that you can use, which we're not going to go into depth now, but those are just examples of the ones we use. Just, for, just as an example, the ones that we use for hockey at the moment are aero, for the aerobic test is yo-yo yo -yo intermittent recovery in table two. Uh, we do the repeat sprint test as well as we do speed testing. Um, a lot of the speed testing and velocity based stuff is done with the GPS. However, you can do it with timing gates and so on and so forth. But the most important is what you actually do with that information. So from a, from a conditioning perspective, one take home message I'd like to give you is that all that conditioning is, is that it's the ultimate challenge of energy system developers understanding that conditioning stimulus causes an internal battle between body temperature, blood pH, sugar, and blood pressure. Athletes that are able to adapt to this chaotic environment within the internal system is, are able to get fitter and stronger. So all that it is, we apply a stimulus on the athlete, the body fights that stimulus to adapt, the athletes are able to adapt to that stimulus quicker and able to control the internal physiolo physiology and maintain something called homeostasis, the better, the fitter they become. And then this is just an example. I know David also went through a whole lot of physiology with you already, and that's just an example of different energy systems for you to have a look at. So the big question is, once we've got all the data, how do we actually use that data? So again, I already said that a couple of things I look at, so I'm just adjusting a little bit, are the maximum velocity, we look at um, aerobic capacity, and then your repeat sprint ability. But if we look at this graph over here, um, what we can see is there's three different athletes. We've got a hockey player, a rugby player, and a soccer player. All have a different maximum velocity, and all have a different VO2 max. What that means is they all have a very different anaerobic speed reserve. And an anaerobic speed reserve is what I use on many occasions to program individually what conditioning and what distances they should cover. So for example, if we set a, thresh, a standard training intensity of six meters per second, you can see it sits differently for each athlete. So for example, the hockey player, that would only be 20% of the anaerobic speed reserve. But for the rugby player and the soccer player, that's 44 and 60% of their um, anaerobic speed reserve, which means at the same intensity, they are all working at a different um, physiological output. What, so what we need to end up doing is say, okay, we're going to program according to the anaerobic speed threshold, sorry, anaerobic speed reserve, and say, okay, we're going to work at 10% of that, 
and then we can go back and make sure that they're all working at the same relative intensity, which is the most important thing, which we'll show you here. So this graph just shows the, the onset of fatigue if we're working at the same um, absolute threshold or intensity. So if everyone for of these, all three of these athletes are working at six meters per second as a conditioning drill, what we'll find is that the hockey player will be able to maintain for a longer period of time compared to the soccer and the rugby player because the hockey player has a bigger base or a bigger aerobic base so their, their system is able to maintain that output a lot longer whereas the soccer and the rugby player will tap into the anaerobic reserves a lot quicker meaning they are going to fatigue quicker. It's almost like that feeling where you get to it and you just hit a wall or the bear jumps on your back and you've got no more and you can't give any more. That's because you tapped into that anaerobic um, energy system and that depletes really quickly whereas your aerobic energy system has a longer duration you're able to utilize that energy a lot better um, from that. So this is just an example of how I'd use that data. So I'll get every individual's velocity at their VO2 max or predicted VO2 max, their maximum velocity um, that they achieved as well. Then we look at the anaerobic speed reserve and as you can see on the top of that graph there are different percentages of anaerobic speed reserve. Now, I can go and program a different percentage of anaerobic speed reserve for each individual. And then you'll get something like this where, for example, we we're looking at working at 10% of anaerobic speed reserve at a 60 second interval. And you'll see each individual covers a different distance in that time. Then I know they're working at individual relative intensity. Otherwise, if we're only prescribing absolute thresholds, they are all going to be working at a different um, relative intensity. And some will be too high, some will be too low. So prescribing it accord, according to the um, individual anaerobic speed reserve or percentage of individual anaerobic speed reserve will help ensure that you're programmed accordingly. The same for mass. I know there was a question on mass the other day. Um, mass is not necessarily a test, but also a means of program prescription and um, individualizing the speeds that you're working at. The graph that you see there is just an example of how we've been going about it in hockey. So you can see these are actual graphs of different sessions within a hockey training program. Um, these are all GPS graphs, so you can see the high spikes with the outlined in green. That are the velocity traces of a session. And then the graph that runs in the blue line that looks like an ECG graph, that's the heart rate. So for example, we got different focus, focus sessions on each um, day. So sometimes we got max velocity focus, sometimes we got um, VO2 max focus or endurance day focus and a change of direction focus. So you can see how each session differs and the higher the intensity the less rest, you can just see that there's a continuous increase in heart rate. Um, and then you can see when you get the rest periods, we can see how the heart rate is recovering from those different drills. Then below those, you can see there's different conditioning sessions. So for example, long intervals, 60-60, 60, 60, 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off. What I want to see there also is how quickly they are able to recover from that intensity that we've done. And that one minute recovery gives me a lot of information um, on their actual um, uh, fitness and how they are actually progressing in their training. Then the other one's the example of a yo-yo test. You can see with a longer duration with a slightly slower speed, there's, an expert, there's a gradual increase in heart rate up to a point and then I'll eventually do a slight plateau, and then there's a repeat sprint test, which has a very high heart rate, but plateaus quite quickly because there's sufficient rest. And then those are just examples on if you want to program your conditioning, you can take a photo and you can um, use those as guidelines for different energy system development. Okay, so the same is true for strength testing. We need a strength testing database for our athletes to see where are they in line with the normative ranges, what are the things that we need to work on? So some of the tests that you can use for, for example, muscular endurance is push-ups, maximum pull-ups, and so on and so forth. And then strength tests, your different 1RM tests, your counter movement jumps, your reactive strength index tests, and medicine ball throws. However, again, it's how you use that data to program that's the most important thing. We already know that um, strength is important for athletes for various reasons. And we know, one, it's injury prevention. And two, we also know that we can um, improve performance if the athlete is stronger. But there are different ways that I've gone about using the, um, strength testing for different athletes. So for example, the first one is your dynamic strength index. 
And this is basically just taking a ballistic peak force and a dynamic peak force. Sorry, I see there's a typo there. A dynamic peak force exercise and looking at the difference between the two. You'll get a ratio from those. So for example, we're scoring um, low, less than 0 0.6, and athlete needs to focus on your ballistic type training. So they, 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 they're fairly strong, but they're not able to produce that force in a ballistic way or explosive manner. Medium of 0.6 to 0 0.8, the athlete needs to work on both strength and um, power. And then a high of greater than 0 0.8, we need to work on max strength development. So it's just a way of going about trying to identify what the athlete needs to work on. So an easy way to do it is a counter movement jump divided by a squat jump. Look at the difference between the two and then you'll get that ratio. This graph just shows the uh, force velocity profile of athletes. And this is done on a, my, uh, an app called MyJump. And it's a really good way to see where they fit within their force velocity profile. For example, this athlete over here, you can see that the optimal profile is that highlighted in blue. And we need to see how we can get them to that. And the way we identify that is, okay, their force is not so great. So what do we need to work on if their velocity profile is velocity dominant? We need to work on strength. And then we can find ways of moving that graph to the right and then hopefully increase their force velocity profile. Um, over time. Then we also got something called your RSI, which is your reactive strength index, which is your flight time divided by your ground contact time. And I'll show you an example of that test over here, where we measure just with a basic device known as a push band. Just give it a second so you can see the athlete jumping up and down as fast as she can, producing as much force as much and as little time as possible. Then we get the reactive strength index um, from that. You can also do a counter movement jump. So you can see here, yeah, the athlete doing a counter movement jump again. We, I'm using force plates at the moment to get different um, forces and information from it. But you can get very basic information by using these exercises to help you program um, your performance programs. Then the most important thing is once you've done all your testing, how do you go about putting a profile together? So the, the Image on the um, left hand side is an individual profile over time. So you go and look at all the data that you collect on an individual, how they're progressing over a period of time, and then set different, set different goals for them to achieve over time. The graph that you see down here at the bottom, over here, that's something called Z scores, and that's their score versus the population mean. So how do they compare to their team? If it's above the um, zero line, they're better than the team average. If they're below that zero line, they're worse than the team average. And it's a nice, easy way to show the athlete where they're at for different um, tests that you do. Then the image that you see on the right-hand side um, is a team profile. And that's really good for us as coaching staff to see, okay, are we on the right track? Is what we're doing actually helping their performance? Are they getting better at different aspects? Again, like I said, this is only one aspect of everything, and we need to make sure that if we tick this box really well, then hopefully that transfers to the technical and tactical aspects of um, your training and your performance. Okay, so if we look at the performance pro programming and how we go about setting up a different program for different individuals and so on and so forth. There are three primary principles that are governing any program that you do. One is the SEDS principle, which is a specific adaptation to impose demands. All that that means, a very fancy way of saying is whatever we do with the athletes, they're going to try and adapt to that. And the adaptations are really specific to what we give them. So for example, if we want someone to become really faster, but we're doing long, slow distance stuff, they are probably not going to become faster. They are going to adapt to that demand or that load or that intensity that we are placing on them. So what we do with the athletes has to be specific, not only to their sport, but also to the individual, as well as their baseline fitness that they are presenting to you with. One of the most important criteria that I use for programming is looking at their training age. And the training age is not their biological age, so not whether they're 25 years old, it's whether how many years they have spent training. Most of the time, my default is when an athlete comes into my system, they've got a training age of zero. Why I say that is because most of the time they haven't been exposed to the type of training and the type of strategies that I'm going to be using to get them better. And then from that training age of zero, I go and progress from stage to stage, which I'll show you a picture of later, uh, from stage to stage to ensure we cover all bases within that sport that we're involved with. Then there's six different steps that you can use. It's very basic. 
um, to do your program design. The needs analysis, we've spoken a lot about the profiling of the individual, the type of sport, um, the, peri the period of the season that they are in, all play a role in your um, performance training program. The exercise selection, training frequency, exercise order, load, volume, and intensity, and also importantly, your rest periods. Your rest periods have to be part of your periodization. If you have not periodized your rest periods in and understanding when rest is important, when loading is important, you're probably going to be doing your athlete a dysfunction um, and won't really improve their performance. So if we have a look at this um, pyramid over here, and this is a pyramid that's very popular and was popularized by or created by Dr. Bondachuk. And basically they are um, five different levels. And on those levels, each one plays a different role within the um, program design. So if we look at the bottom one, we see it's a very broad base of the pyramid, where it's a general where your general preparatory exercises are performed. And those train specific and general fundamental movements within your training program. Generally, I'll try and stay within that GPE for as long as possible with new athletes because we want to ensure that those fundamentals are really well um, grooved and they understand how to do those movements properly before I progress to the more fancy stuff um, or the more exciting things in the high performance program. Then you got your special performance exercises or specific performance exercises. Um, they do not imitate the movement, but they, try, they train the same muscle and the physiolo physiological outputs that are required in that sport. So you're not overloading a sports movement as such, um, but you are training really specific explosive patterns, force velocity patterns that are specific to that sport, as well as even more importantly in certain team sports is you're training the specific energy system required. If you look at most team sports at hockey, rugby sevens, rugby fifteens, um, and so on and so forth, soccer, um, energy system development fitness is really important. However, they need to be able to produce massive amounts of high intensity efforts within a sort of, in, in a period of time and then recover from those efforts. And how do we recover from those efforts? Is by having a really big base. And that's where that general parity exercises come in, is how do we create a very big base to ensure that they are able to recover from everything that we are throwing at them. Then we've got the uh, special development exercises, which have very similar movements to that of the event but are trained on a separate occasion or separate um, section. And what that means is, for example, if you're a sprinter, we'll do weighted, weighted sprinting or sled sprints, um, prowler pushes, weighted accelerations, heel sprints, and so on and so forth. And the same comes into play for um, team sport athletes, where you hockey, we also want higher degree of speed. So how do we go about implementing special development exercises, specific development exercises, is by overloading the ones that we experience in a game. And that will also come down to your competitive exercises, which is the next phase up, which is identical to the movement of the event. Um, for example, with hockey, there will be small-sided games. And one of our main aims when you're doing small-sided games in hockey is to try and supersede um, the intensities and the loads that we experience in a match. If we are trained, there's always a notion that we need to train how we play. I don't believe in that notion, and I think we need to be playing how we train, because training should always be more intense in a match, so no matter what you experience in a match, you're able to um, adapt and cope with it. And that becomes really important. We can't be going looking at training, um, training how we play, because sometimes the match demands aren't as heavy as training demands. And we need to make sure that those training demands supersede the match demands to ensure that our athletes can cope with these um, chaotic environments that they find themselves in within a team, um, team sports uh, competition. So the important part, if you look at the th uh, three little red logos on the pyramid, you can see those. Those are the areas that train the relevant physiological systems for the sport or the event. Um, so they're not necessarily only the training the very specific movements, but training the physiological profiles and everything that you find within that sport. But then your next to your sp special development exercises, your competition exercises, all train the specific movements and specific sports that you're involved with. So for example, a shot putter will be doing shot put in those, play, those times. Maybe they'll be doing slightly overloaded, so standing shot throws. Javelin throws, same. Maybe they're doing javelin standing throws. Hockey players will go into more specific, small-sided games, high-intensity efforts, whatever it is that we want to do to overload the system so they can cope with the event that comes up later on. So this, was an, this is an example of how I've planned for the hockey team over time 
and we got different phases that we want to follow and I wanted to tick each box as we go through the phases. How fast they go through the phases is dependent on not only the individual but the environment that you find yourself in and what we can implement at a certain time. So we were lucky to have a very controlled environment over the last three years or so where we got a lot of access to the athletes. So we were able to create an environment where they are adapting daily and we were able to create an environment where we can pro progress a little bit quicker um, than we would if you're not uh, if you're in a decentralized um, program. So you can see there's different there's four different phases that I like to tick off and there's different focuses. So energy system verb, strength training, movement, education, prehab and warm-ups and recovery strategies. So over those four phases, we need to tick each box to ensure they adapt accordingly. So I'm just going to show you a video and this is all I want you to take home from it is just the evolution of the different exercises over time and understand that it is a process and you got to make sure that you stick to the process and you'll see that your athletes start ad adapting a little bit better. Um, the video is in double speed so it's just to give an example of the different exercises over a period of time and allowing your athletes to adapt to the very basic fundamentals before you start implementing the high-end um, special strength type exercises and power and explosive type movements. So as you go through your program, all becomes more and more specific over a period of time. I would like to use the term it becomes more relevant for that because then we get better training transfer because in my opinion, the only thing that's specific for um, so that is sport specific, I say, is actually doing their sport. So again, these are just examples of various exercises that have been done over the last three years, no, no specific order as such, but just observing the evolution over time on the specificity of the exercises that are performed. Okay, so if we move on to monitoring strategies, and monitoring strategies are really important to me because that forms a large part of my um, doctoral studies. And what we want to understand is that you need to create a database of your athletes and you need to select different criteria that you're going to monitor to try and ensure. So I'll use Excel as an example. And the picture you see is just an example of a database that you can create. Um, to ensure that you got all the data that you're collecting in a usable manner. So for example, all the data will go into Excel for me and the different strategies of monitoring would be from objective data, subjective data, GPS data, neurophysiological data and so on and so forth as well as wellness data. And all that data needs to be put into a database so you can create reports and create an understanding of how your athletes are adapting um, from the training that you're doing. So, for example, all that data goes into your database, into, example, uh, into Excel, and then you create different reports from it. And then I'll show you, these, these are the type of reports that we are currently using. So looking at training load reports, and the training load report is data submitted by the athlete on a daily basis post-session. And what they look at is they give me a score out of 1 to 10 on the, the perceived exertion of that session. And then we get the duration of the session, multiply those two values together and gives you a training load for that day. That's one aspect of a um, subject of training load. And then we've also got the subject of wellness questionnaires, where I get the wellness of every athlete every morning, where they submit data to me so I can see how they are adapting, how they're feeling this morning, are they recovered from the other session, do they have any um, issues with regards to symptoms of illness, and so on and so forth. And that gives us early information on how the athletes are feeling in that day and then we can either carry on as normal or we can adjust the program um, slightly for an individual athlete who seems to be struggling a little bit. Then we've also got GPS data, so you've got two examples of reports there. One is a post-tournament report and one is just a daily training report where we look at the different training volumes per day. So a couple of important aspects that we look on GPS would be the total distance covered in a week high speed distance, sprint effort, sprint distance, and so on and so forth, where we're looking, are we loading them according to uh, uh, um, phase that we want to load them? And then, so it seems like 
uh, Instagram has gone a little bit corrupt there. I've got to put that again. Um, are we loading them according to the loads that we want them to experience? And because hockey, for example, is a tournament-based sport, we don't play a match at the end of the week like you're doing soccer and rugby, we need to ensure that the athletes are tournament ready. And that means they need to be able to cope with playing three to four games in the space of five to six days. Um, and we need to plan accordingly. How do we progress our training frequency and loads according to, make, to that to make sure that the athletes are ready for a tournament? Most of the time, hockey players find playing one match is easy, but so therefore our focus has moved or my focus has moved into ensuring that they are tournament ready rather than match ready. Match ready is very easy for us, but making sure they are able to tolerate those high volumes over a short period of time and recover from them. So sometimes you're playing back-to-back -back matches, sometimes you're playing three matches, one day rest between each. Are they able to recover from match to match to ensure they perform optimally for each of those matches over a period of time? Okay, the last section I just wanted to share with you is, I know we're all in lockdown at the moment, so I wanted to give a bit of a framework on how we can go about programming ourselves um, to try and um, maintain our focus in this period where everyone's in lockdown. Because I don't know what equipment everyone has, I decided to go on a framework basis where you can insert different exercises at different times and whatever you want to do. So for example, the first one is a conditioning framework. Based on its Tabata protocol, it's very well researched and very well shown that it can help improve your VO2 max as well as high intensity effort um, capacity. So basically what you want to do is choose any modality that's available to you, for example, skipping, running, cycling, whatever you got available at home. Perform 20 seconds of all-out effort or 10 seconds rest for four minutes. You can do eight rounds of that and you can progress it over the next um, two or three weeks, however long it's going to be. Rest for two to four months between each set. And then I've done a progression for you where you look, okay, week one, you're going two to three sessions of three to four sets. Week two, three to four sessions of four to six sets. And week three, four to four to five sessions of six to eight sets. It's important in that 20 seconds work that you're pushing yourself maximally, so an RPE of, or a perceived effort of um, nine to 10. So really, really hard effort in that 20 seconds and then passive rest in the 10 seconds. That's an example of um, a conditioning framework. Then if, we look, if you're worried about losing a lot of muscular endurance, a very simple way of um, trying to maintain your muscle endurance would be to choose any six exercises. And in those six exercises, you want to perform as many rounds as possible and performing those exercises in a circuit, <clears throat> excuse me, circuit type fashion. So my advice would be choose two upper body, two lower body, and maybe two core exercises, for example. Um, and then you perform that circuit for an allocated period of time. So for example, first week we've got 20 minutes. You want to do each exercise um, or each circuit as often as possible within that 20 minute period. So we got exercise one to six, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, rest as required, and you just repeat that circuit as often as possible um, within the allocated time frame for um, that week. And for example, I said week two, 25 minutes, week three, 30 minutes. Rest as required, but the clock must keep ticking, and you try better your score each time. Um, if we're worried about look, losing a lot of muscle mass, a really good way of trying to maintain your muscle mass is uh, doing something called giant sets. Um, and all that a giant set is taking four exercises that work the same muscle group and performing them in a circuit fashion. So for example, you take the, you want to work chest, you got push-ups, dumbbells, chest, dumbbell chest press, close grip push-ups, and dumbbell flies, for example, or any variation of exercise that you want that works the same muscle group. Um, then we give an example, so it's gone a little bit corrupt again. I'm sure it will set up now again. Um, so again, we've said week one to one, we've got three giant sets or three to four series, eight to 12 reps and one minute between. So a series is a full set of four exercises working the same group and then you repeat that series um, however often it is presented in the program over there. Then again, if you're worried about strength and power, so a little bit blur on the screen. If you're worried about strength and power, an idea would be to do something called high volume power training, which was very, which is very well researched at the moment by someone known by Alex um, Natara, and he looks at um, different methods of maintaining power and 
expressing it over a long period of time. So an idea would be to go choose any two or three explosive exercises and perform them in a long, high, high volume power um, training method. And what you do, for example, is take a squat jump or a counter movement jump, perform three to four sets of 12 to 15 reps and resting for about five minutes between each set. However, what you want to make sure is that each rep is performed at a maximum intensity so you get that explosive output um, and ensure that you're really pushing yourself for each rep. It will be pretty fatiguing and it can be quite, um, you can be quite sore the next day. However, the important part is to maintain your explosive power and the, 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 the explosive power capacity over a period of time um, and to ensure that you are producing maximum force every single rep, otherwise you won't get those adaptations that you want. And again, you can choose any exercise from clap push-ups to counter movement jumps to dumbbell squat jumps to box jumps to whatever you find that is available in your situation at the moment to produce maximum efforts um, over time. Okay, um, if anyone wants to get hold of me, you can take a screenshot there and have a look at, um, send me a message and ask any questions. But um, yeah, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. So if you want, if you got a question, you can ask. Um, and we can go from there. I'll just turn the screen around so you can see me on Instagram. And we've probably got a minute, a couple of minutes just to answer some questions if you've got any. Cool. I probably missed a lot of your questions, but um, yeah, so if you do have anything, you can give it a go. I know Instagram will probably shut us down shortly because uh, of time. But if you've got any questions, you are more than welcome to ask. Otherwise, I know Sai will be sharing the presentation on there um, for you to be able to review it later on. Okay, everyone, I think we've run out of time. So if you've got any questions, you can drop me a message on any other social media apps. But otherwise, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again. Take care.